So uh, I just want to thank you again for joining us today. Uh, Stephen Barger will be presenting shortly, and my name is Jeff Lind. I'm in the sales department. Uh, we also have Arnab and Carson, who will be uh, helping out today by moderating the chat. So if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to uh, add them to the chat, and then we'll save them to the end. Um, and also a copy of Stephen's presentation will be available, um, which will be shared in the handouts tab on the right-hand side. So as some of you may know, um, Digital Transition is made of three different divisions. Uh, DT Photo brings industry-leading photographic solutions to the world's most discerning photographers. DT Heritage is the leading designer and manufacturer of digitization solutions, including advanced copy systems, revolutionary scanning platforms, and sophisticated automation software for your collections. And finally, our services division, uh, Pixel Cutie, <clears throat> is dedicated to delivering preservation-grade digitization services. We have established a proven track record of successful projects for our clients ranging from culture heritage institutions to corporate organizations. We have three offices uh, located in Culver City, LA, uh, New York City, and Chantilly, Virginia. Uh, if you would like, feel free to reach out to us so that you can connect to us. Uh, social media, uh, our handle is on the right-hand side there. And of course, we have various web pages uh, with tons of info on the different projects and services that we offer. Um, remote and uh, in-person demonstrations are now available, so if you'd like to see something in particular, please let us know. Uh, we also offer equipment rentals, so if you wanted to apply the rental cost towards purchase, uh, this way you can try it out before making your final purchase decision. And uh, Carson, of course, will be uh, sharing a link uh, here shortly, and that way if you wanted to follow us, uh, you'll have that info. <clears throat> So, uh, I'd like to now introduce our guest speaker, Stephen Barger. Uh, Stephen Barger began his photographic career over 25 years ago before the advent of digital cameras. Using a manual film camera was instrumental, instrument, instrumental in teaching him both the technical and visual aspects of photography. The training he received from several nationally known and respected photographers helped him develop his photographic style. Steve is very patient, takes his time to pre-visualize the image and print, waiting for the precise moment when conditions are just right to press the shutter button. He believes that it is imperative to get it right in camera and not rely on post-processing to correct for errors made in the field. He uses post-processing to produce in the final image elements that he saw at the time of capture. Due to his passion for photography and the subjects he photographs, Steve tries to produce images that are technically accurate and visually appealing. His goal is to draw the viewer into the scene so that they can experience the scene as he did at the time of capture. So without further ado, please welcome Steve and Barger. Thanks, Jeff. Um, welcome everyone and glad you were uh, able to take some time out of your busy day to attend my uh, artist talk. Uh, before we start, uh, I'd like to um, uh, extend my uh, gratitude to uh, Digital Transitions for uh, inviting me to uh, give this uh, artist presentation and also to uh, Carson and Jeff for uh, all their uh, behind the scenes uh, work uh, trying to get this uh, webinar coordinated. And, uh, uh, so, uh, the, uh, the talk uh, is uh, going to be in uh, really five parts. Uh, first part is I'll just speak a little more about me uh, personally, uh, since a lot of you folks are uh, probably not uh, familiar with me. And then uh, uh, what I'll do is uh, get into uh, some of the uh, events and occurrences that happened and decisions that I made to uh, adopt uh, medium format uh, into uh, and use that as uh, part of my uh, photographic uh, kit. And, uh, and then um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, why I uh, chose uh, phase one. And then uh, we'll uh, go through uh, some of the uh, medium format equipment that I use and then last uh, will be, uh, I have uh, uh, several images, probably 16 total, that uh, if we have time for, I'm going to go through those and I'll discuss those uh, different, uh, different things about the images, uh, some composition, some technical, uh, some equipment used, uh, just uh, some of the, the thought process that I used when I captured the image, uh, some things. Uh, some things such as that. Uh, so um, I hope that you uh, find this uh, presentation uh, informative, uh, interesting, and uh, entertaining. 
So as, uh, as Jeff alluded to, I'm a nature and wildlife photographer. I've been this for over 25 years. Uh, I'm located in the um, uh, in southwestern Ohio, uh, outside of uh, Cincinnati. Uh, my uh, formal education is uh, about as far from uh, the art world as you can get. Uh, I uh, received a, a BS in electrical engineering from the University of Cincinnati. Went on to uh, uh, do uh, postgraduate study and received my master's, and then I. Um, uh, once I uh, did that, then I, uh, I went out into the corporate world and uh, worked and also taught at the, at the University of Cincinnati. And then somewhere uh, during that time period, I became interested in photography, purchased a, uh, a small 35-millimeter uh, uh, camera, had a 50-millimeter lens, started taking some pictures, and I became very uh, evident uh, early on that because of my uh, educational background that I really needed some uh, formal uh, training in uh, photography. So I um, actually uh, studied uh, under several uh, nationally known uh, uh, nature and uh, wildlife photographers. And those are the, the guys that really helped me uh, develop my, uh, my style of, uh, of photography. I'm a member of uh, NAMPA and uh, the uh, Professional Photographers of America. Uh, I, uh, I've, I've, uh, in NAMPA, I've uh, submitted a good number of images here in the last few years for uh, in competition. And I decided to do that to uh, just find out how uh, you know, my images uh, stacked up. And when you get uh, critiques and so forth, you always uh, learn. And so that was, uh, that was all part of my uh, educational program. And I've done that the, the last three years. This will be my fourth year this year. And the last three years, I've had uh, uh, images that have been picked uh, for, uh, for uh, deemed that they're uh, merit worthy, which essentially means they have a, 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 a set of uh, 12 uh, elements of a merit image that they judge uh, images by. And uh, to be merited, you have to meet all those requirements. Uh, then uh, of those merited images, uh, I've had uh, uh, several that have gone on uh, to uh, be selected for, the, uh, for their loan collection, or now I think they call it their image excellence collection. And they, uh, they're published and they go on display. And then this last year, I had one of my images that went on further and was uh, selected to uh, be um, uh, entered into the World Photographic uh, Cup uh, competition uh, representing uh, the United States. And uh, there were, uh, uh, in that, there were a total of 18 images. So my image is one of them, uh, meaning there were 17 other uh, photographers. So I felt pretty good about that. And then I've had uh, images uh, uh, submitted to NAMP that have uh, been uh, selected for their uh, image uh, showcase uh, over the years. So my journey to uh, medium format. Um, the um, early on, my portfolio was very uh, image specific. And by that, I had 90% wildlife and probably 10% landscapes. I was using predominantly 35 millimeter equipment, well, all 35 millimeter equipment, and it was biased toward the uh, telephoto and super telephoto end. And I, uh, I started uh, selling uh, my work at local indoor and outdoor jury dart shows and was doing uh, very well with that. Uh, but the the work involved in doing those shows is is really huge. There's a great deal of tear down and setup time or setup and tear down time. Uh, the equipment that you need, in addition to just the, the images, uh, the artwork that you're selling, uh, there's a good bit of that with tents, display panels, tables, print bins, etc. And then there's a risk to damage the artwork. Um, it's uh, outside uh, with uh, weather and wind, and then just the, uh, uh, the, the, the fact that you're handling the artwork, you're transporting it, and you're 
uh, putting it on display and taking it down. And it just, uh, you know, it was a huge amount of risk there. But the big thing was the time. And I felt like that was really uh, eating into my, uh, my photographic time. I mean, uh, if, I'm, if I'm not taking images and adding to my portfolio, then I'm not going to, you know, that's going to impact my uh, sales. So I'm, I'm looking uh, at exploring alternatives to uh, how can I uh, better balance the business part with the um, uh, photographic part, if you will. And so I started looking at uh, selling online. Uh, retail brick and mortar galleries and commercial interior designers. And I knew that if I wanted to go further with this, that there was a need for me to uh, better balance my portfolio so that I would have, I wouldn't be so heavily weighted in the wildlife end, but would have both uh, wildlife and uh, landscape. So I'm going to appeal to a wider uh, clientele. Uh, uh, not only galleries and designers, but also the the buyers uh, uh, at those uh, uh, those businesses. So um, I uh, decided that I was going to going to expand, and uh, so I did. And then I uh, and we were doing well. We're kind of throttling back on our uh, on our art shows and increasing the gallery uh, part of this. And then uh, I'm again looking uh, further down the road at uh, commercial interior designers, and when you get into that, there's a that's a whole different market. And the market, to put it in one word, is big. Uh, and by that I mean the 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 requirements for prints is uh, is a lot larger than what you're gonna uh, would be uh, uh, required uh, for a, a gallery or just selling online. So at that point, uh, and there were uh, there were a few uh, lost uh, sales that resulted from that. Uh, so at that point, uh, I knew that uh, I was I was going to have to uh, uh, adopt uh, medium format uh, in order to uh, be able to uh, satisfy that if I wanted to get into that uh, to that business. And there was uh, it's lucrative enough that that it made sense doing it. So. Uh, so at that point, uh, I, I knew that I was going to have to go into the medium format in. So then why phase one? Uh, well, not being uh, familiar with medium format equipment, of course, I'm familiar with digital and I'm familiar with 35 millimeter, but medium format's a little different animal. And so I did a good bit of research uh, on my own, uh, reading and uh, called a couple of uh, uh, dealers and talked to them and really didn't quite get the response and the answers that I was looking for. So I happened to call uh, uh, DT and talk to Jeff and explain to him, uh, you know, where I was, uh, what I was doing and where I wanted to go. And, uh, and so um, we, we talked a little bit and uh, he uh, recommended uh, uh, phase one as a, as a good match. And at the time, uh, that was back when the uh, IQ uh, back had been announced, but it wasn't being released to the public just yet. So uh, what he uh, what he did is he outfitted me with a 645 DF and a P65 uh, plus uh, back and uh, and lens, and uh, with the uh, idea that um, uh, I would purchase that uh, system. And then uh, when the IQ came out, I would uh, I could then uh, uh, turn in the uh, 645 uh, and uh, pay the difference for the the new back. And uh, and I thought uh, this was uh, really a dream come true because it gave me a chance to really get my hands on the uh, on the system and use it to make sure that it was going to fill my needs and um, and over a period of time, so I could use it under various conditions and so uh so i i took the took the plunge and the initially the advantages resolution and that's i mean that's that's uh, just a spec and you can you know that's easy to get to uh dealer support well i felt like i had good dealer support and then image quality and that's something that's uh 
very subjective. Uh, you know, each one of us has a little different idea of what image quality is, and we also uh, that is also based on our needs. Uh, you know, what are we photographing? What are we doing with our images? But I, I, I really had having the opportunity to uh, shoot with the uh, with the phase equipment is I was uh, I was really uh, impressed with the uh, with the image quality, and it's not only the, the, the file image quality, but it's also the image quality uh, that you get with the finished print uh, when when you uh, process using uh, the Capture One software. So uh, I really initially, uh, there was uh, the, the four uh, items here, resolution, image quality, dealer support, and Capture One software were the major uh, contributors. And the Capture One software wasn't part of the initial decision, but shortly thereafter I became uh, 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 acquainted with the Capture One and, and really understood its uh, its abilities, and of course that's grown over time. And then uh, later on, when the when the uh, IQ came out, and then the XF uh, body, and uh, then the user interface there became a uh, a big uh, uh, advantage for me. And uh, as you'll see in a, a couple of images that I have uh, later on that we'll discuss. Uh, some of the older uh, Mamiya lenses, uh, uh, I uh, I really uh, have uh, an affinity for, and so being able to use those is uh, is a real advantage. Uh, disadvantages, weight and uh, cost. Well, cost was relative. I mean, a business decision uh, prompted me to do this, so you're going to get a payback uh, on the on your re your return. You'll uh, so that that worked out. Uh, that was really not an issue for me. Weight coming from 35 millimeter and shooting with a, uh, a 600 F4 lens, um, you know, weight, uh, weight uh, really didn't bother me that much either. So the disadvantage advantages for me were not really uh, an issue. And uh, okay, here. So uh, what I'm doing now is uh, I have uh, both 35 millimeter for wildlife and I have uh, medium format for uh, the uh, landscapes. And that's really the way that my uh, photography is, uh, is segmented. And marketing, <clears throat> uh, so how are, we, how are we doing our marketing now? And this is uh, kind of, uh, I'm, I'm uh, kind of expanding on what I talked about earlier when I looked at uh, some different avenues of selling our work and trying to get a better balance. And so the marketing runs along that theme of a better balance between the business end and the image capture or photography end. And so we have a presence on social media, Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we have a website, uh, bargernaturephotography.com. And there's a, uh, a boutique uh, uh, printer here in, the, in that's local that I've developed a relationship with. It's uh, Robin Imaging, and they do a lot of my uh, metal, canvas, and acrylic uh, printing. And uh, I also have a uh, a gallery uh, on their website where I display my images and sell those directly uh, on their uh, on their website. So if somebody comes to to my website and sees an image they want to buy, there'll be a uh, a link beside that image to Robin's, and they just collect that, click that. It goes to Robin Imaging website and that image on their website, and then there's a whole selection of options, paper uh, and uh, size and framing and all of that, and then they'll uh, take care of the. Uh, of the selling part and the shipping, so I uh, I'm uh, I'm out of that, uh, uh, which is which is good because I don't I don't understand uh, all of that. I'm not in tune to it, so uh, it'd be a, if I try to do it, it'd be a probably be a money loser for me. So uh, this this has worked out real well, and again, it's helped me reach that balance between photography and business the business part. And then we're doing uh, local galleries and some uh, uh, commercial. Uh, interior designers uh, in this last year and a half during the pandemic, not being able to travel, 
is I've uh, done a, a good bit of, uh, 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 put a good bit of effort toward contacting galleries across the United States. And I've, um, and that's worked out well uh, because I've, I'm building up relationships with them and they're, you know, I contact them, they'll contact me. So uh, it's a two way street, but it's, it's working out uh, well for us. So I thought that was one of the, one of the positives that uh, uh, I encountered during the pandemic. Um, we have a, um, a local gallery in a, in a um, uh, renovated uh, uh, manufacturing facility. It's called the Pendleton Art Center here in Cincinnati. There are 200 artists, we're one of 200. Uh, there are uh, sculptures, painters, photographers, and so forth. Uh, they're open uh, one, uh, one day a week or one day a month, which doesn't sound like much, but during that one day, there's more foot traffic in that uh, Pendleton Art Gallery than there is in the other galleries here the whole month. So, uh, and we pre-pandemic, we were doing very well. Now that dropped, that fell off a cliff during the pandemic, but we've opened back up and people were customers are coming back so it's slow but it's it's gathering steam i think it'll be okay uh, but again that gives me a better balance uh with the uh, uh with the business end and and we can open up uh, by appointment as well so uh, and then uh, i'm always uh, exploring other options the equipment part uh, and uh, just a uh, disclaimer here the equipment this is the equipment that i use I'm not saying everybody else needs to use it, but it fits my needs very well. But it's it's kind of interesting just to know what uh, you know what another photographer uses and the reasons they're using it. Uh, so we'll just uh, briefly uh, talk about this. Um, I use a, an Arca Swiss Cube for uh, most of my medium format work. I do have a Gitzo tilt, tilt and pan head that I use to support a Mamiya 500. Uh, millimeter four five apo lens uh, that's a very heavy lens so it needs a good platform to support it uh, i have a gimbal head but that's mainly used for 35 millimeter but i have used it on occasion with the 500 but i prefer the get uh, carbon fiber tripods i have a big uh, a heavy one and then a lighter weight one uh, cameras and lenses i use uh, an xf system with an iq uh, 4150 that's my primary uh, for general landscape work, uh, I, I have wide angle to, to uh, the, the 500 millimeter lens, of course, but uh, a lot of my work is focused on the shorter telephoto, uh, and I can uh, I feel like uh, that gives me a, a good opportunity to op optically extract certain segments of the scene, and we'll see some examples of that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, also use the uh, uh, 35 millimeter Schneider uh, lens for uh, uh, some astro uh, landscape work uh, that works pretty, works very well. And then uh, I'm using uh, the XT uh, mainly for uh, vertical and horizontal movements. So it works well for panoramic and uh, for the, uh, uh, some star trails uh, where I can, uh, don't have to tilt the lens and, uh, and uh, get a uh, distorted uh, perspective. Uh, the XT I'll use when uh, when weight does become an issue, and that's more uh, in travel. There are some trips that I take that uh, there's uh, some severe uh, weight restrictions, and uh, that uh, a lot of times may uh, uh, may affect uh, what equipment that I take. Uh, right now, uh, the XF is my primary system, but as the XT system uh, develops and becomes uh, more uh, mature, um, I could, uh, you know, there's a good possibility that that may end up being my uh, my primary system. But right now, the XT is, but I, I enjoy, or the XF, but I enjoy using the XT. So let's uh, let's take some time and look at some uh, some images. And all these images are uh, were taken with uh, my uh, medium format uh, system. And here's um, a, um, uh, an image uh, I titled uh, Above the Fog. Uh, this is, was taken down in the, uh, uh, on the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. I have a, 
a real, uh, I have a favorite uh, location I like to go to for sunrise. And a nice thing about uh, the area down there is it has a propensity to, uh, to fog. <laughs> uh, so uh, finding a location where you have a valley, you're overlooking a valley, uh, there's a, a real good chance of uh, where you can have some early morning uh, foggy uh, shots. And so uh, this image was uh, early, uh, early in the morning and uh, sun has, uh, hasn't quite cleared the horizon yet, but uh, you've got the, uh, the light uh, reflecting off the clouds. It gives kind of a nice uh, uh, pink tint. And then of course, with the cool blue tones uh, in the uh, valley, just gives a nice warm uh, 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 cold uh, contrast. Uh, I used uh, the, a, uh, the Schneider uh, 240 mil lens uh, with this to, again, uh, just optically extract a uh, section of the scene and uh, uh, used uh, uh, an eight-tenth of a second uh, uh, shutter speed. And I'll, uh, I'll talk about that in just a second, about some uh, special uh, uh, techniques I use to uh, make sure that that's good and stable. Unlike the uh, last image, uh, this is uh, all all-encompassing images. It's the same location, but a different, uh, actually a different trip, a different time. And uh, here you can see that the fog in the valley just really uh, has really settled in and it's uh, extremely uh, dense. Uh, but this was a 12-image uh, a panorama and this was pre-XT. So uh, I uh, did this panorama the old fashioned way uh, again, used a, a 240 millimeter uh, lens, uh, and uh, I uh, started at the uh, left and uh, took a uh, series of uh, 12 images left to right, and each image overlapped the previous image by 50%. Um, a lot of a lot of uh, folks will use 30%, but I found for my work that 50% works pretty good. Um, and uh, it uh, really minimizes the amount that you lose after stitching. Uh, and so I can, uh, I can preserve uh, as much of the uh, images I've taken almost. I, I have to clean up a little bit, but it's not, uh, not very much. Uh, and so this one, uh, there was, uh, I actually took three series of panoramas for this one, starting uh, left to right. And I got to the right, and then I uh, took another series from right to left, and then went back again once more. But the uh, the first one was the one I liked the best because the second and the third, the light was increasing, and the uh, the reflection of the and the colors in the uh, fog in the foreground just weren't quite as uh, as nice. I I didn't think. So here's the. Here's the, the rig that I use. This is one of my behind the scenes shots I'm gonna show you. And the, the uh, 24 millimeter, or the 240 millimeter lens is, uh, is, is heavy. And you've got quite a bit of weight cantilevered off of the front of the, of the uh, XF body. So uh, for longer shots, I like to use a, uh, a, a lens bracket where I'm at, uh, the uh, clamp attaches to the L bracket on the body, but then I've got a support in the front underneath the front element to support the lens. So now you've got two points of contact instead of one, and it tends to uh, help stabilize that. So for longer, uh, longer exposures require uh, longer shutter speeds, um, I, like to, I like to use this. I think it does a really nice job of stabilizing it. You can see the it's uh, clamped to an Arca Swiss cube, and I'm using my, uh, my big uh, Gitzo tripod to uh, support it. Here's a, uh, an image that was uh, taken uh, down in the Smokies, and uh, I've got a titled Above the Fog here, but I really call it Compressed Layers. Uh, but this was taken with the uh, Mamiya 500 uh, uh, 4 5 Apo lens, and um, I, uh, I, I chose it for its ability to 
uh, not only optically extract a section of the seam, but to compress it and give that layering effect. And then you can look in the foreground and you'll see some, some dead trees and those are uh, Eastern hemlocks that uh, there was a uh, invasion of a, of a, uh, a beetle uh, in the area that was killing these Eastern hemlocks. Uh, and uh, I was uh, kind of sad, but it, uh, it happens in nature. Uh, so um, I uh, placed some of those in just for some uh, visual interest in the, uh, in the, in the foreground. The, the color uh, of the light is uh, uh, unique in that this was done during a period of time where there was um, forest fires. And so the smoke in the air uh, was responsible for this color, but I, I liked it. So, uh, uh, but it, it is uh, somewhat unusual. Here's the, the second behind the scenes. I just uh, wanted to show this to give you a, a sense of um, how I try to stabilize this because the, the, this is uh, a, a lot uh, harder to stabilize and, uh, and uh, take a sharp image with uh, without some support. And it's more so than the than the Schneider 240. And uh, there's, a, there's a, 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 an awful lot of weight associated with this. So you can see the Gitzo uh, tilt pan head I'm using. And then the lens, uh, the lens uh, br bracket, uh, unlike the other that had two contact uh, points, now this one has three. And so I have a very uh, uh, definite procedure that I use to mount this uh, lens because I, I, I want to be careful and I don't want to cause any um, stress to, on any of the contact points, namely the bayonet mount between the, uh, the lens and the camera body. So what I do is I place the lens on the, uh, on the, in the tripod clamp, uh, in the, uh, the, the uh, dovetail clamp on the tripod and tighten that down and then I loosen the thumb screw on the uh, tripod collar maybe a, a quarter to a half a turn just enough so that the lens can rotate but I don't want any up and down and side to side movement and then I'll go to the back end and very carefully uh, insert the uh, clamp into the dovetail on the uh, L bracket and then clamp that down and making sure that that dovetail and the clamp line up perfectly, tighten that down, and then go down on the articulated arm beneath that and, uh, and tighten the two connections, the two rotating connections. So once I'm done with that, then the back end is secure. I'll tighten the uh, tripod collar and then go to the front end and, uh, and adjust the uh, front brace so that it uh, contacts the lens underneath the uh, uh, front element, and this does a very good job of uh, stabilizing uh, the, uh, uh, the this uh, setup. Here's a um, a frame average uh, image that I took, and uh, there was a, a storm that had moved through the area. It was uh, late in the afternoon, and it had, uh, of course, it, it, the storm was uh, was out so uh, out of the area and it was uh, getting close to sunset so i noticed over along the uh, western horizon that the uh, clouds were starting to clear and i thought that uh, there was a good possibility that we might have a good sunset that the rays from the sun would be shining through and uh, and lighting the uh, the clouds so i uh, i set up uh, my uh, my uh, system with a 35 millimeter uh, Schneider lens and I'm using the uh, 4150. And so I dialed in uh, an exposure for the, the frame exposure, which is the exposure that, that you would use if you're taking just one, one image. And I got that dialed in to where I had a good exposure. Uh, the problem was is that the water in the lake was uh, rough and with a 15th of a second, it really wasn't enough to smooth that out. So there's basically two choices. One would be to put a, put a neutral density filter on and then uh, uh, 
reduce the uh, uh, go to a slower shutter speed, uh, but that results in uh, noise. Uh, so the other was uh, uh, using uh, frame average. So uh, sticking with the uh, with the exposure I had, I dialed in a, a 30 second uh, total exposure, and uh, then uh, activated the uh, frame averaging tool, and it did the rest of the work. Uh, it uh, took the images and then it processes them in camera and it writes to the card one image, which is the image you see here, that is. Um, was I able, did you hear about the, uh, the waterfall shot? Or you want me to go back over that? Uh, sure, if you don't mind talking from the top uh, for the uh, the waterfall shot here. I think it kind of cut out maybe about a minute or two ago, but uh, you're good now. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll go back and I'll talk about the waterfall shot here. Um, did you get the frame averaging okay, uh, Jeff? All right, the, the waterfall shot's called Cascade, and that's at a, 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 a small uh, a state park about uh, two two hours away from me and uh, it's a very uh, well attended park. So uh, when you go there, especially in the summertime and a hot summer day, there's a lot of, a lot of people there, especially around a waterfall. And there were a lot of people playing in the water, uh, a lot of kids and uh, wasn't gonna make for a, uh, for a nice uh, scenic shot, uh, at least what I wanted. So I used a, I chose to use a 150 millimeter lens and come in and optically extract a section of the waterfall um, where I like the uh, the pattern of the water, and uh, I used a tenth of a second in that it gave me uh, a good uh, uh, good uh, movement in the water, good detail, but it wasn't too long to where it would be uh, just a, a cloud or uh, too uh, quick, which would be the water would be too rough for the waterfall. Here's uh, uh, an image that was taken with uh, with a tech camera, and it was a, a used a Schneider one 120 lens. It was up in um, uh, Acadia National Park. I was out hiking uh, one early morning. It was foggy. I uh, came to a clearing and saw this uh, small lake uh, with uh, fog and a mountain, or uh, not a mountain, a, a an island in the middle. And so I thought, boy, this is going to be a, a make a nice shot. Uh, the sun was starting to burn away the fog, so I had to be quick about it, but I set up and composed the shot, and uh, some of the fog had blown, uh, burned away, but there was enough that was uh, actually uh, 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 blocking the background, so you got a nice blending uh, of the, uh, of the uh, island, uh, and it stands out against the, uh, against the background, uh, uh, I think, uh, very well. Uh, I did use some uh, some vertical movement. Uh, there was some uh, uh, debris in the foreground that I didn't want in the image, so I used some vertical movement uh, to uh, uh, yeah, keep that out of the image. And here's another uh, image from uh, uh, Acadia, uh, a tech uh, camera image uh, that was uh, shot with a Schneider 60 uh, millimeter uh, lens, and here. Uh, I used just a little bit of tilt. I, I have listed down here a degree and a half, but it was probably somewhere between a half and a degree of tilt. Um, I, I, uh, the, the, the nice thing about this image is that the, uh, the trees are back far enough that you can cover the sharpness there with the depth of field. I used F11 because I'm far enough back from them. But the foreground, it's flat, but the leaves and the boardwalk is I wanted to achieve sharpness there. And so that's where I used the half a degree of tilt. If the foreground hadn't have been flat, then tilting wouldn't work. And I, I have an example uh, that I'll show you a little later on where I used frame averaging uh, to um, uh, because there was uh, the, the foreground was not flat. So here's a, a scene up in uh, uh, 
up in Maine that uh, was on a rainy, cloudy day, and it was um, uh, over, overcast. The, the rain had stopped, but I had high overcast. The light was diffused, and the moisture from the rain on the on the vegetation just saturated the colors. So I uh, just really liked the uh, like this uh, this scene uh, just really caught my eye, and again uh, using a uh, uh, a one fifty uh, mil lens uh, did uh, did a nice uh, job I think in rendering it. I don't know if if any of you have been to the slot canyons in uh, near Page, Arizona, but it's uh, just a just a phenomenal place to go. Um, you can uh, and really get some some nice photographs. The um, the challenge with this is the dynamic range. Uh, it's uh, just the, the 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 varying tones from very light to very dark is uh, is quite wide. And I was in there a few years prior to taking this image, and I had my 35 millimeter equipment. And I had to to get a, a a properly exposed shot. I had to use uh, a high dynamic range. Uh, whereas here with this, when I, I was using an IQ uh, 160 and a, a 45 millimeter lens, um, I was able to do this with uh, with one uh, one shot. And I used a, an f22, which normally I don't shoot at f22, but on this, I did uh, for uh, depth of field, and uh, the, it uh, just really uh, it, it really handled the uh, this scene very well. Uh, and it, this is a combination of the uh, of the file that's uh, output from the back and the um, and the um, uh, uh, Capture One software. And here's a, this is an infrared image that I uh, uh, took with a uh, leaf uh, uh, back. I had borrowed this from somebody uh, uh, to use just uh, very briefly. Uh, actually, I just put my uh, uh, memory card in, in his back and took a couple of shots. And this had been, uh, had been converted to a full spectrum uh, uh, back. And they just had the... Uh, uh, UV and IR uh, cutoff filters removed, and uh, so you you can uh, capture the full spectrum of, of light, uh, and uh, then with some uh, filtration, uh, typically uh, a 720 uh, nanometer uh, uh, filter works well uh, for this, and you can get some nice uh, nice shots. Uh, this happened to. Uh, be uh, one uh, using using that, and uh, I just I like the way it renders the scenes. Uh, something different doesn't always work, but when it does, it does. Here's a, a scene that uh, I took out in uh, in uh, Wyoming, and we were out there uh, a couple of years ago for the uh, 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 eclipse. And after photographing the eclipse, uh, we had a couple of extra days before we uh, were, were flying back home. So we went up to um, uh, West Thumb Geyser Basin, and I wanted to do some sunrise, uh, take some sunrise images. So uh, we uh, drove up and get up there, and it's, uh, it's a very active uh, geyser basin. Uh, so there's a lot of steam and some fog, uh, Yellowstone Lakes in the background. And, uh, so anyway, I, um, I, uh, the first thing I did was I got out of the car and kind of walked around and kind of surveyed the area to see what I wanted to, what I wanted to photograph. So I'm mentally, I'm uh, trying to uh, determine uh, images that are going to, uh, that I can uh, uh, potentially take. And the reason I'm doing that is that with all this steam, and there's uh, sulfur and other contaminants in the air. And so I want to mount the lens on the camera in the car and not do it outside where I can open up uh, the inside of the camera and it can, uh, it can be contaminated with uh, all of these, uh, these chemicals. 
so trying to plan ahead of time then i and i knew that a, the 240 uh, millimeter lens would be the the choice so i um i uh, uh set this uh it, the, put mount went back to the car and mounted the lens on the on the camera body and went out and uh took several images uh, then when i get back in the car i clean the you know wipe the camera body down but uh, I, I don't want to open up uh, the uh, inside of the camera and, and subject it to something uh, such as uh, the uh, sulfur and other contaminants. Um, and uh, uh, what I did is when I when I set up, I just kind of left the uh, uh, stayed there and waited for the position of the of the steam to get in such a uh, such a manner. Uh, that uh, the composition of the scene was what I wanted where I've got the trees that are poking through. Uh, so it took a little bit of time, not a lot, because it's, it's moving uh, uh, fairly, uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, this is the uh, scene I was talking about earlier with the forest path and the, and the tilt and the flat foreground. And this scene uh, does not have a flat foreground. Um, and you've got uh, leaves overhanging in the trees. You've got the rail fence, and so uh, the uh, to try to use uh, tilt on this would would not really really work. So this is a, a good example of where focus stacking uh, would uh, would take care of it. Uh, so uh, I used uh, focus stacking here, and uh, uh, and it, it it worked well for me. Here's a uh, an image of uh, out in uh, Death Valley, a uh, place called Zabriskie Point, and at uh, Zabriskie Point, I, uh, it was uh, it was in the summer. It was in June, and it was it was hot. It was uh, very hot. But it was late in the afternoon, and I'd been there uh, photographing the uh, patterns in the uh, landscape. And Zabriskie Point, millions of years ago, was underwater. And there were um, uh, minerals deposited uh, due to that, and also some volcanic activity that caused these uh, various uh, colors uh, to appear in the uh, in the landscape. So it makes for makes for uh, I think a real nice subject. And so I've been I've been photographing the uh, the landscape, and then uh, all of a sudden uh, clouds rolled in, and the sun went behind the clouds, and uh, it was hot. Didn't look like uh, cloud cover was going to clear anytime soon. So I'm going to leave. And so I packed uh, the uh, left the lens on the camera body, put it in my backpack, and gathered everything up. And I'm walking back to the car. And for a reason, I decided to look over my shoulder. And I see that uh, the uh, sun was uh, poking through, and I could see these uh, rays of light. So knew I was going to have to to photograph this. So I uh, scrambled around, set tripod up, and I just took the, the camera with the lens I had on it, put it on, took a shot, and knew that wasn't uh, the shot. It was too wide. So um, I didn't want to, but I wanted the shot. So I um, actually changed the uh, lens and went from uh, 35 to uh, 75 to 150. Knew when I had a, I wanted a, about a 150 millimeter uh, uh, focal length. And so I was able to capture a couple of shots. Uh, this was the first of two uh, before the uh, sun went back, and it just uh, it never did come out. Of course, I didn't I didn't stay much longer. I had what I wanted, so I thought uh, it's time to go back and get uh, get in air conditioning. Uh, the uh, the color in the uh, in the rays and the intensity of the rays, I think a lot of it's due to the fact that uh, out there you've got salt and dirt, sand, and all kinds of um, contaminants in the air and that tends to not only reflect the light but also to uh, uh, to filter it so you get this uh, uh, unusual uh, unusual color and the, the last image that I'm going to show you I call Cincinnati trails this is a composite um, I uh, so obviously it's an image that I photograph locally and um, I kind of planned this image ahead of time in that I wanted the North Star above the uh, tall uh, uh, 
uh, building uh, with the uh, uh, round top, the Tierra top. And uh, so I uh, went down with uh, my uh, iPhone and I have an, an app that given uh, a date and time, uh, it will tell you where the position of the stars are gonna be in the sky. So I could really locate where I needed to be to have the North Star over uh, the uh, Great American Insurance Company building. So I went down and did that. It's nicer to do it in daylight uh, than trying to do it at, at dark, you know, after dark. So I, I knew the location, uh, so I marked it, went back that evening with my, uh, with my gear, set the tripod up, waited for blue hour, and took a, um, an image uh, uh, of the uh, lit skyline with the uh, dark blue sky in the background, and you got uh, just a little bit of reddish color in the uh, on the left uh, from the setting sun in the west. And so uh, I took this image, left everything untouched, and waited an hour and a half. Came back and adjusted my uh, exposure for capturing star trails, and took uh, about an hour and a half of uh, star trail images. And then uh, I, uh, then what I do is I stack the star trail images to come up with my one star trail image. And then I blend that with the uh, uh, foreground uh, uh, skyline shot of, of the city. And then that was, uh, that yielded uh, this, uh, this image here. Uh, does, um, I, that pretty much concludes what I wanted to talk about on the images. So, we can open uh, open this up for uh, questions. If anybody has any, uh, I see. Uh, I saw one uh, one question on leaf movement, and uh, yep. yeah, John there was asking, about John. Uh, John asked the question in the focus stacking example: uh, yeah. Did you have any problems with leaf movement? Uh, there, I noticed when I was stacking. I noticed one image in the stack that there was some leaf movement. And what I do when I do focus stacking is I take more images than is needed for, for focus. And so there's a, a huge amount of, of focus overlap from one image to the next. And that way I can identify that image with leaf movement and I'll throw it out. And it, in, this, in this situation here, there was uh, the leaf movement. There wasn't hardly any wind at all. So uh, it was just a matter of just a little bit of movement in one frame and, and with leaves and that was it. But that is an issue that you need to be aware of with focus stacking, yeah. Great, I think um, and Adrian also wanted to um, see if you talk through the focus stack image more detail. I hope that uh, clarified it for you, Adrian. Um, and and the, one thing with focus stacking, uh, this just came to me, is when I'm doing it, is I will focus on the near point and the far point in the focus stack. The near point, I will focus closer than what I think I need, just in case I'm I underestimate <laughs> uh, my, uh, my my range of focus. And in in the image that I had. Um, it went to infinity, but let's say that I was, if I was focusing from uh, two finite points that were, uh, that one didn't uh, extend to infinity, I would go a little beyond that and a little in front of my front point, just so I'm sure that I got everything covered. Uh, Great, I think that answers the, uh, the question. Um, all right, I think we have uh, one more question here uh, from Mike. Is that kind of next? Uh, okay, we can answer the question from Adrian. And then uh, next up is a question from Mike. Uh, he asks, he says, I was very surprised at the use of long lenses over 80 to 110 that are typically used. How did you get to that point? <laughs> that's, uh, that's probably a carryover from my 35 millimeter shooting. Uh, I just, I don't know. That's just, I guess uh, the best way to answer that is that's just kind of the way I see things. Um, doesn't make it right or wrong, but that's just my vision. 
Um, I do use 80 and 110 a little bit, but not uh, predominantly. It's a little longer, probably in the in the 120, 140. Uh, although uh, uh, I did I do with the cam, I would use a 60 or 50 quite a bit. Uh, and uh, uh, but yeah, it's just that's probably the best way to answer that. It's just more my vision. All right. Sounds good. Uh, okay, we have uh, another question from uh, Nick here. Let's have it come up on the screen. Uh, well, let's go ahead and read it out. Uh, so Nick asks, my question is about dynamic range of the phase one gear. Uh, how much more dynamic range can you handle? For example, in the vibrant red sunset picture, did you need to use any sort of ND to prevent the foreground going to, going to silhouette? Uh no, and that is the uh, that's the advantage of using the uh, frame average. Is that um, I can if I didn't do it, then I would I would probably use some sort of ND to bring out some detail in that in the dark area on the side. But with the uh, frame averaging, uh, I'm able to uh, retain detail so that I can. Uh, you know, it doesn't go black, and that—that's the advantage of the frame uh, frame averaging. But if I if I hadn't used that, then uh, uh, it um, I might have been able to uh, photograph that without using an ND. But there would have been noise reduction that would have had to been implemented in the dark area, and uh, the image wouldn't have. I don't think it would have been as good as it was with the uh, with the frame averaging. To be honest with you. Great. Um, so, do we have any other questions from the audience? Um, I think we answered most of the questions, but um, I guess one thing I'd like to know. I know we have uh, one more slide for you. Is uh, I guess upcoming trips. You know, obviously, as everything's opening up here in the states, uh, you know, everyone needs time to travel with the summer. Yeah. So, uh, uh, tell you, this is a, it's still getting a, a little frustrating for me. Uh, it appears that um, uh, travel in the United States is opening up. I'm going up in the main here in August uh, uh, to do some uh, uh, night photography. And uh, uh, so I, I think that'll be fine. But I've got uh, a trip to uh, Greenland with, with uh, phase one uh, equipment solely and that has been postponed twice and i'm hoping that the, it will go this year i've got a couple of trips into canada and the canadian border has not opened up yet and i don't know whether it'll open up at the end of summer so that's kind of iffy and i've got a trip down into south america at the end of the year but the way things are going down there now is I'm not sure that that's going to open up, uh, but um, uh, if not, I've I've got a couple of in my back pocket that I'm going to do. Uh, if I can't, if I don't make it up into Canada, I'm, I'm going to. I got some things I'm going to do here in the states uh, out west um, that uh, will take the place. But uh, it's uh, it's opening up, but it's still kind of frustrating because it's uh, it's not. It, they're pockets. Their, their pockets that are opening up and it's so it's it's uh it's difficult <laughs> it's a challenge yeah, yeah definitely yeah. um all right here's uh one more question from the audience from hans uh he asked has steven used iq for a long time to simulate nd filters uh i uh i don't have uh, a long time i'm not sure what you uh what you would classify as a long time, but I'd say I've been using it for the past year, uh, using the uh, frame averaging. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that's what is alluding to uh, the, the using of frame averaging. Uh, so um, uh, I'd say about a about a year, uh, a little more, maybe a year and a half. Let's say a year and a half. It, I started using it after it came out, and then uh, uh, then. Uh, didn't do uh, do anything for a while and then back up in it again. So a lot of it is just uh, you know, the requirements on what I'm photographing as to whether I need to do it or not. 
but it does. Uh, what I will say is that uh, that what I've seen so far does a it does a good job of handling uh, the dynamic range and and providing you with detail in the darker areas. Now they do caution you about uh, overexposing light areas, so you you still need to be uh, be pretty careful about uh, picking your uh, your exposure. But uh, it does do a good job of handling uh, handling that. Excellent. And uh, I guess I don't see any other questions for now. And uh, I guess one question I had would be um, obviously between your XT and XF. I mean, I know it obviously depends on where you're going. And um, but how do you, if you had to choose between the two, like how do you go about that whole process? A lot of that's going to depend on what I'm going to photograph and the weight that I have to. Uh, that I'm that I'm uh, allowed to carry uh, if I'm flying somewhere. Uh, right now, with the with the range and what I'm doing, uh, the um, uh, XT uh, probably fits the bill uh, a little better. But as I use the XT more and more, I'm getting uh, more and more comfortable with it. Uh, I I like using it more and more. Uh, so um, I can see that as uh, as re you know that could. That could easily, in a in, in a, uh, a year or so, be become my primary camera. But having said that, as I'll still keep the XT, uh, uh, I don't I don't have any in, intent on uh, on uh, getting rid of it because I uh, some of the things that I do, the projects I work on, uh, it's still a, a viable piece of equipment for that. All right. Well, um, let's see here. Do we have any other? Ah, yes, we have. Uh, let's have another question here. Um, but I guess it's, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, guess my, no, I see that. Yeah, that I, I was. Yeah. <laughs> I was. I was waiting for that uh, question. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is a that is a beast. Um, I, uh, I I'm not going to uh, attempt to walk uh, very far. I mean, I might walk a mile, but not up a uh, steep hill. Uh, but uh, I, I'm going to be limited in, in how far I'm going to go with that lens. That thing is, that is, that is just an absolute beast. But uh, it it does for, you know, for how old it is, I, it just, it's really a, a, a nice piece of equipment and does a really great job. I like it a lot. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's the downside. The weight is a downside for that. And there's no no way of getting around it. And uh, if I could hire somebody, uh, or uh, I'd, I'd do it. <laughs> uh, too many people. Uh, yeah, for those that yeah. didn't notice, um, there's a question in the chat about the uh, the 500 millimeter lens, uh, one of the BTS shots that uh, Stephen had earlier in his uh, presentation. So the uh, the weight and everything that's uh, what we're referring to. Oh, there it is. Yeah. There's the uh, question that just came up. So uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of supporting equipment to that, but oh well. Yeah, definitely a lot. All right. Well, it looks like um, you know, if we don't have any other questions, um, you know, I guess we're just split over our initial hour that we planned for. Um, yeah. If there's anything else that um, someone, I guess, you know, thank uh, everyone, of course, for thank Stephen, of course, for taking the time to uh, bring us through your work and to show us everything, and of course, the audience here for joining us for this webinar to learn more about Steve's work. Um, you know, obviously there's different ways to connect with us and also with Steve, uh, social media, our different handles on Instagram and such. Um, but of course, you know, at the end of the day, if you're all available before, you know, by email, phone as well, uh, if you guys want to uh, get in touch and we can help, you know, help you on your next trip or, you know, just bounce my ideas off or you know, whatever you guys are, whatever you guys want to discuss. So. Thanks everybody. Uh, appreciate you, uh, taking the time to, uh, listen to me and, uh, sorry about the one little, uh, <laughs> Uh, little uh, loss of signal that we had, uh, but hopefully that didn't uh, affect everything too much. Yeah, and it happens, right? So yeah, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, we're gonna close out here for very shortly. Um, and uh, again, hope you guys have a great day, have a good rest of the summer, and uh, stay in touch. Thanks, everyone. All right.